Let's this conference this will now be recorded. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for uh, five in our series of six April Tech Chats. We are thrilled to have you with us for putting it all together today. Uh, we have, uh, if you're if you're somehow not aware, we have done a series of tech chats. Uh, the first one was kind of like, oh, what am I supposed to do? Kind of a general breathe. It's okay. We're going to get through this together. Here are some life preservers. And then we did a series of three chats, each one focusing on a different mode of communication. And today our fabulous presenters are going to walk us through um, kind of the integration of all of those things. Uh, and they're going to give you their, their tips and tricks. So Alice has uh, shared with us our, in the chat the link to this presentation. And embedded in that presentation, we have um, the links to each of our presenters' presentations so that you can go through and peruse their information at your leisure after the chat is over. Uh, Alice, do you want to do a quick greeting? Sure. Is my mic on? Yes. Oh, great. It's very a uh, bit of a lag time here. Just wanted to say from uh, Foreign Language Educators of New Jersey, thank you so much, uh, Julia, for facilitating, Christine, Ashley, and Maris for coming in and sharing your expertise with us. And uh, this has just been such a pleasure as we've been able to come together and just really support one another in this uh, certainly historic and difficult time and uh, I'm just so proud of you all as educators, as human beings, um, just for for the support and universality that I'm seeing among the world language uh, population as a whole. It's just been really heartwarming. So thank you folks for joining us and uh, thank you Julia again for facilitating Christine, Ashley and Maris for your expertise and look forward to hearing from you all today. Thanks Julia. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I think we should all take a moment and pat ourselves on the back for the enormity of what we are currently attempting to do and have been successfully doing for several weeks. Even if it doesn't feel super successful, it's worth noting that we are still communicating information in a way that we were not explicitly trained for. So even though I know that a lot of people show up and they're like, please give me the tools I need to do this better. I think it's really important, especially for our mental health, for us to all kind of be like, we're, there's something to be said for what we're already doing. Sure, we can improve. Sure, we might get a new tip or a new hack or a new platform that's going to help our students. But ultimately, you know, we're we're doing our jobs and we're doing them really well under ridiculous circumstances. So take a moment and give yourself some credit for that. So our facilitators today, so excited. We have really just had like a star-studded tech chat series. So Maris Hawkins is with us. She is an elementary and middle school Spanish teacher from the Virginia, Washington, DC area. Dr. Ashley Warren is an elementary Spanish and dual language immersion teacher uh, from Ashley West Windsor, West Windsor Plainsboro. I think I said that correctly. I apologize if I didn't. Um, <laughs> And she is our New Jersey teacher, Flange Teacher of the Year. So we're very excited to have her back. Some of you might have caught the interview that I did with her that was on our Flange YouTube channel. Um, and Catherine Ousselin is uh, the tech god of the French world and a high school French teacher from Washington State. So we are thrilled that she could be with us today. Um, so here's just a quick overview of some of the things that we're going to be talking about. We are kind of free to go off piece. So if you have a question about something, we're going to have some question time at the end. Feel free to put it in the chat and we will get to you as soon as possible. We uh, will also make sure that you have the presenters. As you see, you have their, their Twitter handles there. So you can certainly contact them or us after the chat is over. If you're like, hey, I still have a question about this thing, feel free to do that. And uh, we do want to share with you that, um, you know, Flench is offering this resource kind of as a goodwill thing because we know how difficult uh, this whole period is for teachers, both in the state of New Jersey and also all over the country and the world. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So if you are in a place financially where you might be able to uh, drop a five or ten dollar donation, we would super appreciate it. The link is here. Um, that would help us kind of continue to create high quality programming like this so that we can continue to help you as we kind of move through these unprecedented times. All right, I am going to stop sharing my screen.
And I am going to turn things over to Ashley, who I believe is going to be our first presenter of today. So Ashley, let me know if you have questions about or issue sharing your screen. We might have lost Ashley. Yay, I think Ashley's back. Ashley, call yes. Ashley. Sorry. Cool. All right, no <laughs> worries. Is it time for me to start? <laughs> It is. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, let me share my screen. And y'all, if I if my internet drops, just continue. Maris can pick up or Christine can pick up. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. If someone can just tell me when they're able to see it, that would be great. I got you. All right, you are good. You see it. Oh, wonderful, thank you. All right, well, hi friends. My name is Dr. Warren, or Ashley Warren, and I am currently a kindergarten teacher in a dual language immersion program. I teach math, science, social studies, and language arts entirely in Spanish in an immersion kindergarten. But this is my 10th year teaching, and I taught high school Spanish, Spanish one to AP Spanish literature and culture for several years. So um, I just wanted to share some reflections um, from past te tech chats. Um, and from talking with other teachers so far. So I just wanted to put out there like grace for all of us. Um, I know Julia had just mentioned that and like cheers for all of us. We really are doing, teachers are doing an amazing job um, adapting to the current situation. So I just wanted to say cheers for all of you and grace for all of you and all the things that we're trying and are attempting to do. Um, I think just major cheers for all of us. I wanted to just throw out there that we can still think like language teachers even though Basically everything we know about teaching inside a classroom brick and mortar walls has changed. We can still provide input, check for comprehension, encourage or create the, um, a place for interaction and output and then provide feedback. And I think while we're really, really focused obviously on encouraging and pushing student proficiency, we also wanna really look for ways to connect students and help encourage social emotional learning right now. And so two of the great ways that I've seen some teachers doing that are through providing student choice and choice boards with um, tech activities and non-tech activities and just um, different modalities of learning, songs, uh, short films, um, just lots of art, lots of ways for kids to, to connect connect and bring them themselves into the work um, and ways that acknowledge them as humans with feelings and preferences um, in this really difficult time. I also have seen and have been able to play a lot of games with my kids, which are great for checking for comprehension, but also just encouraging kids to laugh and to have fun. And, and that's often one of the things that they love about our classes in the brick and mortar building anyway. So being able to do that right now is a really familiar, awesome way uh, to connect with our kids. Um, I did want to encourage y'all, if you do have a start of class routine that you use in your classroom when you're teaching, to try and keep it up now, as crazy as that sounds. And if you don't have a start of class routine, it's a great time to try and start one. Um, I know now teaching kindergarten, I do like a morning meeting every morning. Um, and whether you're a specials teacher or you're a homeroom teacher or you're a, you know, a special area of French, Spanish, German, Chinese teacher, you can start the class reviewing the date, the days of school, the um, weather, like fun facts, jokes, words of the day, target language expressions, going over calendar math. All those things are really familiar to our students and I think it provides that comfort of a routine right now. I've also, I teach littles, um, little kids, so doing a read aloud right now is also really fun um, and they're really enjoying that and it's a great way to provide some input. Um, so that's been a great, a great joy. Um, Another idea is to invite students to engage um, in, a, in a couple different ways, like show and tell, the student of the week, students of the week in my class get to make a physical or a digital poster about themselves, having a question of the day that I post on Google Classroom or Seesaw or Padlet or Flipgrid that the kids get to answer. And those have just been really nice ways, routines that I'm building into my, my online class um, so that the kids are getting a chance to interact with me 
and use the language. Um, some quick thoughts on grading and feedback. My district has been using the line compassion over compliance. Hold on, I just wanna see. Can y'all see, still see my screen? Yep, we can. Great, okay, sorry. Uh, my district has been using the line compassion over compliance and this idea of just knowing that trauma-informed education, like this is traumatic for our kids right now. Like, heck, if we're honest, it's traumatic for us. And so just in every way that we can, and I know every district, every school is different, but to try and act and teach with compassion um, and, and just understanding that kids are gonna turn things in late, they might not turn things in at all. It's not just about doing the work, um, but like we're world language teachers, we already know this. Like it's about empowering them to communicate and meeting each kid where they are. Um, on that note, I, I truly believe it's more important for us to be giving feedback um, instead of grades right now. I recognize that many districts are still requiring grades. My district is not, thank God. Um, but that feedback is what we could use to, to meet our kids where they are and push them forward and encourage them and to drive their learning. Um, I have found success, I found this successful with my AP students. You know, like I would get these AP essays handed into me for the high school. And they're like advanced, you know, intermediate, high, advanced, low, and they're producing so much. And I was like, where do I even start with giving feedback? And I just found it really helpful to ask the kids to give me choice, or I gave the kids choice in what kind of feedback they wanted. So I would say, do you want me when I read your essay or when I read your short answer or when I look at your project to focus on your text type? Do you want me to focus on agreement of subjects and verbs? Or do you want me to focus on some aspect of grammar? Do you want me to give you feedback for general writing strategies, what would you like feedback on? And asking the students to tell me what they wanted feedback on, um, it really limited. I didn't feel like I had to give a million different types of feedback. I could really meet the kid where they were and address the types of feedback they wanted. For teaching kindergarten this year, it's a little bit harder because the kids don't necessarily always know what they want feedback on. So that's definitely more of a middle school, high school thing. Um, and then a, just a note about academic integrity, because I know a lot of people were asking about that in past tech chats. Listen, like, it's just real hard right now. Um, one of the strategies I found that's really successful is using DraftBack, an extension in Chrome. And so I can play back a Google Doc to monitor student work to see if they copied and pasted a whole chunk of text in, which is indicator, generally an indicator that they used a translator. Um, and, and I've just found it also really helpful to remind students, I happen to be the National Honor Society advisor at my school, so that's like a really good check on kids. Like, hey, like character matters. Like, you know, this is a, a greater part of being a student of integrity. We care about what you can do with the language. We know it's not perfect. If it were perfect, you wouldn't be in French too. You would be in AP French or you would have tested it out of a language, right? So we wanna see what you can do. Um, and we want to help you be a person of character. And if there's a breach of that agreement of character, we are gonna talk to the National Honor Society advisor, we're gonna talk to the guidance council, we're gonna talk to our assistant principals, we're gonna talk to your parents, and just kind of having that conversation, not in a threatening way or a consequential way, but just couching it in a language of character and, and having kids produce work that's consistent with their proficiency level. Um, I have attached here two sample rubrics that y'all can look at if you're interested. They're just samples, by no means perfect, but I put a not as high and an intermediate presentational rubric just in case those were helpful to anybody. Um, and I just wanted to, to close with a list of Seesaw or Google Classroom hacks that I've collected from my colleagues um, that I think have been pretty helpful. Um, if you're overwhelmed with stuff that's going on digitally, I have like 15 different tabs open. I'm certainly overwhelmed. Our kids are even more overwhelmed because sometimes they're sharing devices with older siblings or with parents. There's tons of stuff open. They don't know where to click. Um, so I just thought these hacks were a little helpful. Putting dates in the document names are your friend. They help the students, parents. They help you figure out what document um, is being worked on which day. A reminder to always double check your sharing settings. I've had music teachers and art teachers sending me um, videos to upload and then I go to share it with my kids and they can't see it because the sharing settings are not set to anyone with the link or those within our domain name with the link so that's a good reminder um, I've been trying I use Google Classroom and Seesaw for my different groups um, I've been trying on Google Classroom to rearrange the order that I'm posting the materials so that the material that I need them to look at first is on top 
um, which I know sometimes it does that automatically, but sometimes I'm referencing uh, an activity that I posted a while ago. So kids have lots of digital files. So if you can rearrange the order so that it makes sense, that would be great. I've also started labeling um, documents as must do or optional. because Sometimes I just post resources for the kids to look at. Um, and so just labeling it optional, I think gives the kids freedom and takes like a weight off of them. I've also realized, especially because we're world language teachers, we want to leave instructions um, both in writing and audio if possible. I know that Seesaw allows you to audio record your, Seesaw is like Google Classroom, it's an education platform for, for littles, generally for elementary kids. Um, it, it allows you to leave audio um, instructions and I found that really helpful because then the kids get to hear me reading the instructions. It supports multiple modalities for learners and the kids get to hear the pronunciation of the target language teacher. Um, I, Google Classroom, you can absolutely upload an audio file with your instructions as well. Um, a reminder that as teachers, it's really good for us to think about accessibility right now. Um, I know I have some colleagues that are uploading things as Word docs, but then my kids say, oh, I can't see it because it's a Word doc because I'm doing it on my phone because I only have internet on my phone. I don't have a device other than my phone with internet. So just thinking about ways that we can make sure that our work is accessible to kids. Um, and I've just really found with my kindergartners having an ongoing Padlet um, where the kids can post videos or pictures has been really, really helpful and really great for, for allowing those connections in class. The kids are commenting in adorable five-year-old ways on each other's videos and pictures. Um, and it's one permanent link that I've been using for the last five weeks. And when I go back and look at it, it just makes my heart so happy to see um, all the progress that we've made in one place and with my kids commenting and interacting with each other, it's just a joy. So um, I have some more things here in this document. If you'd like to come back and look at it at your own pace, I have ideas to engage learners on Google Meet, Zoom, or video calls. I use Google Meet to talk to 55-year-olds every week, multiple times a week, and so I have ideas for how to play Pictionary, how to do TPR, how to play charades, how to play mystery words, hangman, all types of ideas for Google Meet calls or Zoom calls or video calls with your students. Um, and then I have low tech and low screen time activity ideas, and I have screen time or tech dependent ideas. I think these run the gamut from novice to advanced, from kindergarten to 12. Um, I have some uh, activity ideas, and I have some resources and tools that have been helpful to me. And I would like to throw it over to whoever's gonna speak next. I don't know if it's Christine or Maris. That's awesome. Ashley, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And for anybody who's curious, all of our presentation or that's not a word, presentationers. I like it. I'm, I think I'm going to make I it. I like a word. it. I think you can make yeah. it a word. Yeah. All right. We're going to go with it. So, all of our presentationers presentations are linked in our presentation. And Alice has um, shared the link to that in our chat. So, feel free to uh, take a look at that. You can follow along as we go, or you can look at it later at your own pace, or you can pull up the recording of this uh, tech chat, which is gonna be on the Flange YouTube channel, if that's more your speed, if you're the type of person who wants to listen to it again as you go through. So tons of options. All right, um, I believe that Maris is up next. Maris, does that work for you? Yes, yeah, it does. All right. Okay, so let me pull up my screen. Okay, is this showing up? It is. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, I had a little bit of an introduction earlier, um, but I, this is my Twitter handle, at Maris Hawkins, and I have a blog as well that I linked, which um, that I've been blogging about some of the ideas that I've been using in my classroom. I will say um, I've taught in a hybrid or blended setting before, and so I've taking classes and all of that, even this was a huge adjustment for me. So like for someone who has done this more or less before, this has been just, it's been a lot. Um, so as everyone has been reiterating, um, you know, go easy on yourself. So up until this past year, I was a high school teacher, a Spanish teacher and a middle school as well. And now I am back because before that, I'm back doing um, pre-K through eighth grade Spanish, a variety of levels. So I'm going to really focus on um, what I'm doing in my middle school and high school, although some of this is talking about what I'm doing with my fifth graders as well. Um, 
so let me move this over here. I don't know what you guys are seeing, but I'll move. Um, so one thing that I've been doing is um, to talk about assessing multiple modalities. I will assign students an article, give them guided notes to take what I want them to take notes on, and then discuss it in Flipgrid. So um, my students are reading a book about bullfighting currently. These are my eighth graders. So this there, and they've had Spanish most of them since pre-K. So we're talking about your Spanish three level. Um, and so they read about um, the different sides to bullfighting. And then I had them brainstorm what um, were the problems with brainstorm or with bullfighting what was a benefit with bullfighting and then their opinion. So really a lot of what they're giving me is just what they've taken out from the article. And then the only thing that they're kind of coming up with now is their opinion. At least for me, I recognize like many of you do that that temptation to use Google Translate is there. And I think while we're giving ourselves grace, we also have to extend that to our students. Um, they have a lot on their plate. And so, whereas I have found that um, many of my students are not using Google Translate, I have a couple who normally don't use it and are using it now. Um, they're given a list of things to do every day. And so just keep that in mind when you're planning. So I'm trying, when I'm doing these things, I'm trying to really think about having them um, pick out important ideas, kind of saying that in their own words, and then giving me their opinion to keep it short and succinct. Um, I am still required to give my students grades. Um, and so the way that I'm doing to also discourage their use of Google Translate is um, I'm giving, especially with my um, with my eighth graders, one thing we're focusing on is um, saying a sentence and then supporting their thoughts. Since they're, and it, most of them are around intermediate low, some of them are towards the top of intermediate low, closer to intermediate mid. So talking about a sentence and then supporting it. Why is that? So that's one thing that I put in my rubric. Um, and, and then the second one is understanding, which is, can I understand you? So typically if they've used a, a translator, they're not used to those words and I can't understand what they're saying. Um, and then vocabulary. Are they using vocabulary that they found in our unit and in what they've read as opposed to other random words that we haven't talked about. So those are the three things that I assessed my students on with this particular platform. Um, I saw in a question earlier, someone said, how do you decide kind of what, what to use? I am sticking mostly with, um, as far as assessments, I'm sticking with Flipgrid, um, and then Google Tools and Edpuzzle. And then I'm just coming up with ways to um, do multiple things within that platform. So for example, Flipgrid, um, they're able to record themselves and I can moderate it so they won't see other people's response. Or I can, if I wanna do it a little differently, they can see other students' responses and also respond to them to get some of that interpersonal speaking in as much as you can um, if you're not doing a synchronous class. So that's um, that's one way that I, I've done with Flipgrid. Um, and then the other activity, so this is um, for my fifth grade and we're talking, we've read a book about um, with some environmental themes. So we're doing a unit about plastic in the sea. So going back when we were talking about using choice board, that's um, what I did here. I, I gave, did a slideshow in Google Slides, and then I had students discussing their takeaways. So they had to choose two. I found a video. Um, there was an article, an infographic. There are two videos, um, and then some memes. Um, and in each of the slides, I said, you know, take notes on five new words and a couple of other things. So at the end, after they chose to, and I should say, especially for my fifth grade, I have um, a heritage speaker in that class, and I have one student who's coming from immersion, which is why I like doing this, because I was able to kind of 
give them some choice to challenge themselves to try something harder. Then I had my students um, go to the Flipgrid and then record their top five important words that they found from um, in total, and then explain two things that they learned using those sentence starters. So here's where I um, I I pulled. Um, some sentence starters that would help them discuss it. And I also attached a Quizlet for my students to see that as well. So um, these students are, depending on the level, but some of them are novice mid and some of them are starting to reach up to novice high. And so this is how I did the same, a similar activity, but in still using Flipgrid um, to have my students talk about that. Um, and then another way that I'm doing is to, I've been doing a lot of assessing interpretive reading, and one of my favorite um, websites that I've been relying on is Matt Miller's Ditch That Textbook. He has a ton of graphic organizers ready to go um, in either Google Slides or Google Drawings. And so this one, um, they're reading a book about Felipe Ayu, and so I, I just said, um, he discussed the I, the problems that he encountered again, so my students can pick it out from the book and then write mostly what they're seeing. And then I'm assessing: is it an important event? Did it happen um, in in this in these chapters that we're talking about? And then also again, same things like: can I understand what you're saying? So this is um, one graphic organizer that I've used to assess my students' interpretive writing. And then another one is you could have students take notes on a video or a reading and a video and then compare them in a Venn diagram. And again, here you're seeing um, what students understood, yet they're able to go back and really use those sources that you're providing them with to um, to get a lot of the words and phrases that they need. And then this just allows them to um, put them on a graphic organizer, and then you can see what they understand based on how they're organizing everything. Um, I also, it's also nicely incorporated in Pear Deck. Um, a lot of people talk about highlight reel, like what, what does things like what looks really pretty and then highlight real like what really happens in my class so my highlight reel for this was i planned all this i found this is all on slides mania i got excited i did it all and then half of the slides on Pear Deck, i forgot to put that they should type or draw or something so and then i tried to go back and change it after i had assigned it and that didn't work um but anyway it it looks it I, I like it for the future. So I came up with um, a couple of different ideas. This is again around um, the, the um, Juegos Panamericanos that um, Felipe Ayu played in. And so I had students um, read some tweets, look at a video, and then at the end, I had them reflect on what they had learned in English. So if you're not um, familiar with Pear Deck, that is a an add-on to um, to Google Slides, and it makes all of your slides interactive, so students can draw um, their understanding. They can they can answer questions. They can do multiple choice. And um, I just saw this morning that Pear Deck has added the ability to record your voice in the slide in Pear Deck as well. So that's an exciting addition um, as you're doing that. So again, when we're talking about multiple modalities, students are able to um, read everything and watch videos and then synthesize at the end, which I think is also important when we're talking about what we want students to do, is to really push them to be reflective about the work that you're doing and not just kind of give assignment after assignment after assignment, but really try to tie it all in so students can see the purpose behind it. Um, another thing, so I, I'll use Edpuzzle a lot, um, but I like to incorporate extension questions into an Edpuzzle, so not just asking those comprehension questions, but in this case, um, this, this is 
something that I'd done last year, but my students were reading the book Santana, and then they were they watched videos about other um, Hispanic singers, and then they were comparing and contrasting what they knew from the book with what they were learning in the Ed Puzzle. So um, I, with with um, Ed Puzzle, I like to add opinion questions and extension questions so that students can include those and include other sources in their answers, not just the Ed Puzzle that we're talking about. Um, I, I haven't done this as much, but it's something that I want to look into in the future, which is assessing interpersonal writing. I have some Latin colleagues that have done some great interpersonal writing assessments. Um, and I think if you have the Google, um, if you have, excuse me, the synchronous time to do it, this might be a great way to have your students um, write more that doesn't um, encourage them to use Google Translate as much um, because it has to be a lot quicker. So like I said, if you're doing this synchronously, then that might be something to play around with. And um, it's on my to-do list in the future. So an idea if um, if you're thinking about doing that. And I like doing interpersonal writing now because that's what most kids are doing as opposed to presentational writing, which depending can lead to a bit more temptation to um, translate it all. Um, so thank you. And I will throw it over. Yay, thank you, Maris. All right, Catherine, our yeah, tech Catherine. guru. We are ready. <laughs> okay, that's very cool. Well, we are among so many great ideas. I'm going to uh, throw it up here for the share. Give it a second, of course. Okay, so, I, oops, sorry. I'm looking at this blending with intention and integrity because I think that if we get a lot of tools thrown at us, um, we, we just start grabbing because it's easy, it's free. There's so many reasons that we're using technology right now, but we need to still think about it before we grab it. Um, I'm always saying, thinking about thinking, we've got to just be thoughtful users. And even though we're panicking, this, this still takes some time. So I'm going to show you a few things real quick. Um, same thing, I am out on the West Coast, so I'm in Washington State. If you need to get a hold of me, you've got my Twitter, et cetera, um, information and email. That also works. I have a website where I put um, my, my curriculum design and also all the web tools, and that's a huge thing. I can't show all that because that would take a couple of hours, and we don't have that. But just we want to design these activities that are that are good for our students um, here in Washington State. The governor's um, uh, and the superintendent of instruction says do no harm. That's how we're looking at education right now. Do no harm. So we want to make sure that these are something that promotes their learning or at least maintaining their learning and that align with world readiness standards. So it's not just um, you know, flashcards, because flashcards are one thing, but what are we doing? And I love Maris's idea. She blends those those modes so well. It's just beautiful to see what we're doing out there. But that also means not everybody has that comfort level with technology or the tools. So whether you choose all of these or just a few, we're just remembering why we why we chose them and what we're hoping to do for our students. And so we're looking a little bit at the interculturality and technology issue. Um, people ask about that because like, oh, technology doesn't lend itself to interculturality. But I'm going to show you a few things I'm using with my students. I have French 2 through AP, but because of a situation um, with uh, my colleague, I'm also teaching French 1 uh, as a surprise. So it's been an interesting moment to, to grab all these things back and figure out how can we still, oops, what? what? Oh, it, okay, that's all right. So I've been using, <laughs> it took me a second, Amanda Sandoval's stuff. Okay, share my webcam. Okay, we're back. Catherine, you sound like you, yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, would you mind unsharing and then resharing your screen? Okay. My apologies. No worries. I just wanna make sure that all of your brilliant slides show up in the recording. Okay. And we'll do that again. Back up. Yes, thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to put it back up here. So this is a picture, but it's also a link. 
and it will take you to the actual um, slides that I made for my students. And I'm gonna show that here for right now. So when I left my students in French 2, we were just about to start um, foods. And we always look at it from a theme, like this one is mes préférences alimentaires, my food preferences and habits. But the big deal is that we're looking at school lunches around the world. And if some of you have seen me present before, that's a big deal I have. So I'm taking a couple of ideas, what I heard just in um, our first two presentations, the dates at the top, okay? So this is week one. And then here are essential questions. I put them in French and English. And then I've, just for this week, I said, what are the two things that I can do? I can identify food and their food groups, and I can explain my, my food preferences. So then I made a little arrow in here, and Amanda has this beautiful, um, Amanda Sandoval has a beautiful template. I tried to replicate it. Um, this is what I have. So it tells you, okay, you're gonna go on to number two, and it says, here's the vocabulary. It's a Quizlet. Uh, excuse me, that's my website. And then number three is a Quizlet. Okay, so it's got some activities. Number four is where we pull it together. And that I'm gonna show you this um, as my first time ever, and that's thanks to Nathan Lutz, who is also a teacher in New Jersey. I believe you all know him. Um, this is a seesaw I built. There was two videos up here also that are gonna help the students with their um, with learning about the food groups and vocabulary. I'll come back to the seesaw in just a minute. But then if you look at this presentation, I also have this week's work. Okay, so they did their seesaw. This is week two, and I've got the date up there again. And the question still hasn't changed, but now our can do's. So they're going to be able to describe food, the texture, and they're going to use some vocabulary. And that's me pulling in the new words that we're trying to get to them. And then we're looking a little bit about adjectives and agreements. So number two, again, they've got um, a beautiful slides that I made up for them for the vocabulary. And I just wanted to show them how do we describe food texture and taste. And I picked out some pictures. I gave them some examples. And so I didn't give them the actual word in English. I basically pushed the word um, through pictures and examples. Okay, so that's what they're looking at in number two. Number three, it's another um, Quizlet. And then in number four, it's a Google form. And it's got three activities with my students actually watching last year's students in French too. They made these little videos with um, my school avatar. And I'm not gonna play any of them, but you'll have this link. And these were uh, just these kids, you know, when they're first learning um, their food vocabulary, it's 38, 40 seconds of, of speaking. And they pick an avatar and it dances for them. And it says, I like to eat uh, bananas because they're squishy and delicious. And so if you, if you look at these videos, they're kind of silly. Okay, so that's what they're going to do is they're going to look at last year's videos because I can't do this in class. I can't get them the app. Um, it would have been on our school iPads, but they're going to watch other students work and they're going to come back and say, what did you understand? What food words did you hear? And then was their, how, you know, what, was their video presentation easy to understand? And that's what I'm saying to them. Remember that you need to be able to speak clearly and um, with confidence so that people can understand you. I also made a little video for them <laughs> where I did a demonstration. I had all brought home my, my plastic fruits and vegetables. I made this video that shows them how masculine and feminine adjectives agree. And then I gave them a Disney video. Um, it's a Disney video about the pastec, which is um, a, a watermelon. And then I had some extra little questions for them. And I'm always asking them to write in English. For right now, for me, um, the interpretive mode is the most important thing that, or how do I say it? It's the one thing that I can do the best on um, supporting the students with. Presentational writing, like, like Mara said, we can't really expect that they're going to do great work with that. And then interpersonal, we can do some stuff. But for right now, if they're interpretive listening, interpretive reading, I can control that and then I can check their knowledge by having them explain it in English. Okay, so they're not going to be able to just Google Translate this video. And in fact, I checked, they can't get the, the subtitles in English. Haha, <laughs> sneaky me. But I had mentioned that the students would be doing a seesaw post. And this is what I created for them for that first week. I gave them the instructions on the first page. 
So they're going to look at the vocabulary of the food groups and which words can you identify. And then they're going to um, use the drag and drop function on Seesaw to put them in. And on the third one, they're going to look at fruits and vegetables and they're going to talk about their personal preferences. They're going to record themselves saying those sentences. So again, we're mixing the modes in here. And the first one, they're just reading. And it's pretty good picture. They can see the different food groups. Okay, that's easy. And then I have these pictures to the side. This is a completed, um, this is Blanca Mendoza. She, it's her third language, like most of my students. Um, they dragged the pictures into the right group. So I know that they used this picture to show that work. Ooh, okay. The last slide is, and there's a little recording here. Um, I had all of the fruits and vegetables over and around. Okay, so it says, I like to eat. I don't like to eat. I've never tried, and I gave them that word right there because that's new, jamais essayé, and I refuse to eat. So on this first go, they're just putting the words in the categories, so they had to recognize those words. If they don't know what la pastèque is, they would go back to our vocabulary page and look that up. And then they recorded themselves saying six of these sentences, like, j'aime bien manger les avocats, je refuse de manger les oignons. Okay, so that was a great way for me to grab a different, a couple of different modalities in there. There, and then um, the next thing they're going to do, we would have done is, I have these uh, food pictures from um, school lunches in the Francophone world, and I had made a map for them on Google Maps. And this is where I said, okay, I want you to get to know the Francophone world. And if you look, they're little school houses, even over in Tahiti way over there in Tahiti, okay? When you click on that, you get the school and you get a link to their lunch menu. So I had taken those pictures before and put them on there and I said, okay, I want you to design your ideal school lunch in a French speaking country. They took a picture of the cards. We won't have that because they're not gonna have the cards. I'm still thinking of uploading the pictures onto um, Seesaw and having them choose from there. I'm thinking on that. And then they record themselves. For my, ent uh, my entree, for my first course, I would choose this because I like or I don't like. So now they're going to start chunking, you know, different parts of sentences to make a big, fat, intermediate, low presentation. I love this. I'm going to have them actually go look at the school lunches. Now, um, I've been checking the links because, uh, like us, these schools closed in March. But luckily, I have some of their menus. They keep their menus up for the whole year. So I can send them to December. And I just would like them to look around and see it. Well, if you're living up in Quebec, what would be a typical school lunch compared to my friends over in Tahiti? Uh, what are they eating? The kids are like, oh my God, they're eating raw fish. And I said, well, of course, if you live in the ocean, that's what you're gonna eat. So when I designed these activities for the students, I also did it for French three and French four, haha, <laughs> because Let's face it, we're all stuck at home and we're all eating. What else should we talk about but food? So to keep my sanity, I'm having all the students in two, three, and four study the same um, idea. Now, French three and French four, they did this last year in French two, but now I'm upping it and we're talking about identité culinaire, like depending where you live and what is produced in your area, what will people have as a regional um, specialty? And so I have, again, this. I use the same, same template, but I wanted to start with the United States because my students are very, um, they only really know about Mount Vernon, Washington. And I wanted them to get to know some of the food specialties. So I gave them two videos in English and I'm not too worried about that. Plus I gave them some images to look at that are um, showing what do people eat around the United States, okay? When they were done, they had a little um, Google uh, form to fill out based on what they saw in these videos. What would you like to try? What do you think is gross? And their first thing is that they didn't want to try grapple or something from Delaware and the Cincinnati five-way chili, which is one of my favorite things in the world to eat. To help them get through this, I'm not sure if you know this link. Whoops, it's not popping up. We'll go to it just by hand. I'll fix that. This is called the Learning Apps. It's a free website and I really like it. They have so many different types of activities. You can browse those. There's some that are already made and the types of activities that they have are just 
overwhelmingly beautiful because you can add pictures and text. So I'll show you this one quick. It's real user friendly for little kids. So I put a map of the United States and I put little pinpoints. When you click on it, you have to look at the word and you can get this, like it says green chili stew, right? And then you have to associate, well, what do you think they eat in New Mexico? And some of them chose like the fish sandwich. And I said, no, no, walleye, walleye fish. Okay, um, you're in New Mexico, probably not walleye. So, you know, we were getting that interculturality in there because the next thing we're gonna talk about on this one is the, um, the regional specialties um, in France. And so I'm going to teach, uh, I'm going to teach, uh, I'm going to share with them geography and cultural identity and how we tie our identity to our food, because that's what we're doing right now is eating a lot. Okay. So we've got those activities for the students and it's just a wide variety of them. Now you have the link to this whole presentation because I, as I usually tend to do, keep going on and on and I've given you more tools and ideas. This is what I usually present at a conference. I've been to Flinch before. Thank you guys so much. So if you need even more ideas, you can play around with this and you can always get in touch with me if you've got questions. And I'm going to stop the share because I think that was enough, right? That's got to be enough. All right. So, and I, mean, I believe we could, we could literally sit here for another two and a half hours and just let you good. keep going, and all of I, us would but, scribble. But, <laughs> but you notice that those tools, Google Slides, most people have used. It's the things that I chose, right, that support what I need or want or hope that my students will engage with. And that's what I'm saying. It wasn't fancy tech, none of that was fancy. It was just meaningful stuff for students to do to show how they've engaged in the language. So uh, yeah. thank you. Oh, thank you, Catherine. That was amazing. Merci beaucoup, beaucoup. De rien. So <laughs> we have um, about 15 minutes left um, before we all, you know, go do whatever is next on our jam-packed daily schedules. So if anybody has any <laughs> questions, comments, um, anything you want to follow up with, feel free to unmute your microphone for a moment or drop a question in the chat and we'll kind of finish out our our conversation here today um also don't forget uh while we're waiting for questions to come in that uh our this whole tech chat is going to be recorded and as soon as the video and audio are processed it will be available on the flange youtube channel so don't forget to click that subscribe button and then pass it around to anybody that you know who was not able to be here today. We want everyone to be able to benefit from these resources. And um, you're gonna get a follow-up email this afternoon from me that will have um, obviously my contact information and the, the evaluation form. So if you know of anybody who could benefit from today's uh, Google Slides presentation, feel free to email me and we will resend the link if it's something that you didn't get a chance to open and have on your computer before the end of the chat today. All right, so Matt has a question. Uh, what is the food website that Catherine showed before? Um, my first the, thought is I think we're gonna need to be a little more specific, but maybe you know, Catherine. Do you mean the learning apps? Probably the learning apps where I built that that map, right? So it's- Okay, so the- I'll put it in the, the chat real quick so that Fabulous. you can see it and then you can build one if you want based on your um, it's called learning apps but there's so much more you can do on that but it's a fun one okay and, and then, then you did, did the school lunch one on Google Maps right yep I made the, the um, so I went I, I visited all the different schools I got the links to their menus I put um, on a Google map I made I put the little schoolhouses and then from there there's a link and a picture a picture of the school and a link to their menu it just makes it visual okay. for the kids so they get a better idea of what the world looks like <laughs> pushing in the geography right it's true because if you think about it you know when i was going to school we did like france like we stayed in france all the time so even now if someone was like okay you have to pinpoint tahiti on a map i would be hard pressed to do it and i've been a french teacher for I'm not going to tell you how long, but, but like <laughs> this is something that a lot of our kids don't necessarily know how to do. I think and that's one of the great things about like the five C's, right? Like I'm seeing in just your one slide, I'm seeing connections to other disciplines, like a greater understanding of your own community, a look at our own cultures, but other cultures and doing that all within the context of communication. That was what was so impressive about that to me. Thank you. That's, that's one of my goals is just to make sure because what the first time I ever presented this, 
why students haven't maybe been outside of our our state some of them really and you say so what do they eat over there in florida and they're going florida what do they eat so you got <laughs> i mean it's true before we and i even look at we we usually start in washington state what are things that people know as from they're like starbucks I'm like yeah but things that we <laughs> produce, because we don't produce the coffee we just we just cook it you know <laughs> And, and you you'd be surprised what high schoolers do and don't know and it's good to come back and look at how we as world language teachers can support what they may have forgotten i'll put that gently right um from their social studies classes as they were going through school and now they know um that the world has a better um, approach to school lunches because our whole project then after that if we had been in school was let's take pictures of our school lunch and show that to the school board which they presented in French to the school board on this is why our school lunch sucks did you know though we're in Tahiti they have five course meals and they present that in French to the superintendent and they actually made three changes to our school lunch based on our presentations I that is that's I, amazing it, it, you know we had something like, go ahead no I, I just like that's what we we don't study verbs okay we're very proficiency we're very thematic we're very global based in our in our program but it's just let's change the world one school lunch at a time right that's amazing <laughs> so uh but, we have a question over in the chat um what is a good website for infographics for elementary um both for creating infographics and also for finding ones that have been pre-made so maris or ashley would you have any insight on that um i would say in general when i look for infographics for any of my students um i think i learned this tip from amy leonard a long time ago i actually google it and i go to images um so whatever you want infographic in your target language and then images um if i'm gonna have my elementary students make them i would have them make them by hand i and just take a picture of it um I wouldn't have them do anything. But when I, the youngest I've done is sixth grade and I use Canva to create my own infographics and I've had sixth graders use Canva with pretty good success. I have as okay. well. Um, and then for finding them, the, I think Maris, you probably said it this way and I just wanted to add that I've had a lot of success finding different um, target language countries by doing google.pe for Peru, google.es for Spain, you know, figuring out what the, uh, that way I'm just including a broad range of uh, infographics. I've also found that looking on Twitter, like Ministerio de Educación de Peru, like Peruvian Education Ministry and going on their website and they're posting lots of infographics on school lunches for kids or on the school day schedule or on COVID-19 for kids. Um, and so looking at Twitter handles for departments of education or schools of education or ministries of education in different countries has been really helpful. And Catherine, I, I see just, you just posted, are both of these, uh, I know the Pinterest board for the AATF French is a fabulous place. Yeah, like because we post possible. a bunch of, I mean, I, I thematically curate all the, the infographics I can possibly find from all over the world to make sure that teachers have a good resource bank. So our wakelet is a different approach to it. So it's a little less, Pinterest is fine. You know, it is visual. Wakelet is organized and I like things organized. It doesn't have to be pretty, <laughs> but it is. Um, I use Twitter and Instagram a lot with the hashtags to find those. So if you are a French teacher and you need anything, you know, follow us on Twitter because I'm always retweeting great ideas for you to use in class and how to use them. Like on our Instagram right now, I've been posting every couple of days, like here's how we take a current topic and share it with our students so they can do a little bit, a little bit of a writing activity. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. It's great passive PD. And especially um, in terms of like the hashtags, I know that I get a lot of great things just by curating my Instagram feed and my Twitter feed so that, you know, I'm following like the Ministry of Education or, mm -hmm. you know, like the Patrimoine, like French Patrimoine, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, that kind of thing. Especially if you can get the original site in the target language or the original count in the target language, that's a really good way to um, just kind of have things fall into your lap that then you can say, oh, I think I'll save this. And you put it away until you're ready to use it and, and uh Maris, i think it was what'd you say oh i think um instagram lets, lets you make collections 
so that yes. you can start putting things in chunks. That's I'm a hyper yeah. organizer, sorry. Yeah, and Facebook too. You can save things to collections when you save them. Um, so sidebar, I don't know if anybody does like a house unit, but there's a Facebook group called View From My Window that people from around the world are just sharing pictures. It's so cool. I'm so excited. I've been, I think I've saved like 85 at this point because I'm definitely going to need 85 pictures of views from people's windows, but you never know. Um, <laughs> and Maris, I think you uh, you shared uh, Leslie Gron's Pinterest boards, which are veritable gold mines of, and they're for all languages and she has them sorted by language and there's a ton of useful stuff there. Awesome. All right. Any other questions, comments for our presenters? Can Waffled like the Flange YouTube page? What? Can Waffled like oh, the Flange please. YouTube page? That would be fabulous. And if it has not already be, been done, it will be reciprocated. That would be we, marvelous. We're just starting ours. I've, I've do every, I do the website for Waffled, so now I'm doing the YouTube and I'm just like, ooh, this is a very good idea. <laughs> I'll make sure to Thanks. like your videos. Oh yes, please, please do. And yes, um, we would be very grateful to everyone in the chat if you would subscribe and help us kind of spread the word. Um, we're really hoping that we can reach as many people as possible just because we worked really hard to curate all of these chats into you know modes so that people can find what they're looking for. So we would be very grateful for all of the signal boosting that you could help us out with. All right, thank you so much to our fantastic presenters today that I have like pages and pages of notes and I'm going to go back and rewatch this four billion times. So this is very, very exciting. <laughs> Shannon just shared the link to the Flinch YouTube channel in the chat. And I think that is a wrap. I'm going to stop. Thank you so much. Here. Good